Next, we have a conversation with one of America's most venerable couples, two people who have written the book on wisdom and old age. Eric and Joan Erickson do almost everything together, and they've been doing it that way for a lifetime. As one of America's patriarchs of psychoanalysis, Erickson and his wife and main collaborator, Joan, have spent much of that lifetime creating theories of human development. Erickson's seminal work involved his theory of the life cycle. Divided into eight stages, life evolves from infancy to old age, producing conflicts. And as each conflict is resolved, basic strengths emerge. For example, in infancy, the conflict is between trust and mistrust. When resolved, hope emerges. For young adults, the conflict is between intimacy and isolation. From that comes love. In old age, it's integrity versus despair, which leads to wisdom. Now in the final life cycle themselves, he is 87 and she 86, the Ericsons have broken new ground by spelling out how each major stage of life can evolve toward wisdom in old age. Two years ago, together, they wrote Vital Involvement in Old Age, their prescription for warding off the despair of the gradual physical disintegration of the body. The Ericsons are now putting their theories into practice, including choosing younger people to live with them and share their household. This year, Joan Erickson added another spin all her own in her book, Wisdom and the Senses. And while the partnership of over a half a century is still very much intact, the grand old man of psychoanalysis wants this time to be Joan's singular moment in the sun. So he joined us for an interview in their Cambridge home, but mostly, though not always, deferred to the woman he once described as de Schöne, his native German for the beauty. All these years you've been helping Eric write his books. You've just written a book. Why did you decide to do that? Well, I, I've read a lot about the development of the senses. That's the first chapter, and it talks about uh, when they develop and how they develop and how they can be encouraged and kept acute and uh, and what what that means for perception and what that has meant and can mean. And so there's a whole major piece of work there about that. And I try to follow them a little bit through life and show how they do lose their acuity later on and what a loss that is for mm -hmm. older people. So that's the main thrust of that part of it. Then I'd like to see that uh, we, we prolong the acuity of all the senses so that they are acute advisors and guides in what we do. Because we talk at great length about the need for perception in everything. And yet we don't seem to gather that that perception is the, the work of all of the senses together. And when they work in, in harmony and together, then we can perceive accurately, and otherwise we can. What happens with the senses in this final life cycle, old age? Oh, they're so vital that that's one of the reasons I feel so strongly about this, because it's the senses that begin to fail. Your eyes fail, your hearing fails, and your sense of taste fails, and your sense of smell fails, your sense of mobility fails, your sense of touch gets much less acute. And those are the things that old people uh, falter with and fail. And it's, it's very sad to see this happening unnecessarily and uh, with as little attention as we pay to it. So in other words, if we paid more attention to the senses earlier, they would be preserved for later? We're much more interested in care than preservation, you know. We have wonderful doctors to take care of your eyes when they fail. And everything else about you, when it fails, you rush to the doctor. But nothing's been done up to that point to make them acute and to preserve them. And this is a great loss to all. And you notice it most when you get older, because that's when you begin to feel as if you're falling apart anyway, which you are. <laughs> <laughs> so what kind of advice would you give to people of all ages about old age? 
Well, I think there are two things. I think you have to keep as many fields and areas of interest open as you can so that you don't close doors behind you in your progress toward one door and one area of knowledge. Keep a lot of interest uh, viable. And the other thing is that I think they should pay a great deal more attention to their bodies and their senses because without them, none of these things become really uh, vital and important and uh, alive. You've been studying all the life cycles. When you got to this final one, did you find there were any surprises? Well, I must say when I was much younger, I always thought that life would go until you got to be kind of middle-aged and then there'd be kind of a plateau. And then in the end, you just fall off the edge, you know? And uh, it doesn't turn out to be like that at all because it continues to be uh, a very surprising adventure. I mean, all kinds of things happen that you had no idea about. And you make decisions to do things that are entirely out of uh, keeping with jumping off an edge or a plateau. Like what? Well, like moving here and, uh, and starting up a whole new way of living with younger people and everything. And I, that wouldn't have occurred to me as a possibility. I had, I had a sense of fading away earlier. And I find that you just go on learning all the time, and it's much more interesting and exciting than I had any thought of. So you think it's important for old people and young people to be together? I think it would be terribly boring to be in a community of older people who are constantly talking about uh, the good old days one way or another. Good old days or bad old days or whatever they were. You talked about wisdom and old age. Is it only when you become old that you can have wisdom? Well, one reason we said you have to be old or we feel that you have to be fairly old, you haven't experienced all the stages until you get to be fairly old. And I think there are probably precocious younger people who are quite wise. But in order to have the, the perspective and the experience which uh, adds up to what wisdom might be, you have to have lived it and uh, faced it head on and you experienced have it. One? You have to have faced it. You have faced to have it. been in it. And then you have a better concept of of what is there. Eric, do you feel wise? Unfortunately, yes. <laughs> Why unfortunately? Up to a point. Tell me about it. I don't think that wisdom is something that happens all over again. But it is something that becomes, that slowly becomes part of your life experience. Wisdom it's not just a matter of know knowing something and having learned something, but having learned to, s to be sensitive, having learned to sense something. In other words, an experience which only gradually becomes mature in life. But am I correct, John? Oh, absolutely. So it's, it's, it's becoming older is something to look forward to because there are rewards. Is that right? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. All I can say is I sh should think so. <laughs> <laughs> Better be. When do you begin to prepare for old age? Well, I think people prepare much too late. They look upon, they get very well prepared for kindergarten, <laughs> for school, for college, and then for jobs, and they're full of their preparations for these things. And they think that after that, that life just kind of uh, keeps on at an even keel. And they don't prepare for the time when they are not going to be able to do the things they have done uh, as younger people. And they're not prepared for what's ahead of them, which is, has to do much, much more with culture and with uh, the various things that you can keep busy with all your life 
and you don't have to have a great physical stamina for or uh, competitive ability of some kind. Those things, like the arts and, and uh, all of the things that connected with the arts would be much more satisfactory as something to live with. And I don't think enough people uh, have the courage to start with things when they're older that they might. Because they're you're used to getting A's all along the line and they don't want to flub <laughs> when they go into a class, a poetry class or a drawing class or, or it's something in music. And it's, uh, it holds them back because they're afraid of failure. And that is uh, the end of things if you're afraid to fail. You've got to be ready to fail with anything you do. Mm. Because that's something new to discover where your weaknesses are that you didn't even know. <laughs> Tell me the secret of relationships like yours enduring through the life cycles. Madam? <laughs> how, do, how does it work? Uh, I have to tell you a story once. Uh, a young man was working in our garden and had been married fairly recently. And uh, he turned to me and he said, Mrs. Erickson, you've been married so long with Mr. Erickson, you must be very compatible. And I said, oh, heaven forbid. That would be boring as all get out. <laughs> I would have lots of squabbles and lots of differences of opinion. And that keeps life interesting and it keeps you growing and it keeps you adjusting to one another and makes life, you know, full of interesting new facets. And he said, I've been married two and a half years. <laughs> he shook his head and I said, fight it out <laughs> and make it work. And you have to have a sense of humor, <laughs> otherwise forget it. Mm -hmm.